Wang Chong, the Rational Philosopher. Modern Western writers have noted that Wang Chong was one of the most original thinkers of his time, as many of his opinions went against the cherished foundations of his society. He is described as a straightforward, non-boastful writer who most likely did not think he was as good as he actually was. His conclusions can seem as alien to the modern eye as the superstitions he was rejecting, because there was no functioning scientific method or larger discourse to assist him in his clear and well-ordered beliefs. Despite this barrier to his work, he still gained some fame, although it was mostly after his death. Wang Chong reacted to the philosophy that dominated China during his lifetime. Taoism had long ago changed into a religious and magic way, Confucianism had now been the state religion for some 150 years. Lao Tzu and Confucius were worshipped as gods and omens were seen everywhere. Belief in ghosts was almost universal, whilst Feng Shui, the belief in Qi and a universal energy had begun to rule people's lives. Wang ridiculed all of this whilst vocalising a rational, naturalistic account of the world and the human place in it. The Han Dynasty is considered a golden age in Chinese history, which has influenced the identity of its civilization ever since. It lasted for over 400 years, but was briefly interrupted by the Xin Dynasty from the years 9 to 23 AD, so its dynastic reign is separated into two periods. The Western Han, which spanned from the year 202 BC to 9 AD, and the Eastern Han, which continued from 25 AD until Tao Pi became the Emperor of Wei in 220. Wang Chong was born back in the year 27 AD, two years into the Eastern Han period. He was an astronomer, meteorologist, naturalist, philosopher and writer. He developed a rational, naturalistic and mechanistic account of the world that was neutral towards anything referenced by religion. He accurately described the process of the water cycle and proposed a materialistic explanation for the origin of the universe. His main piece of work, the Lu Cheng, meaning critical essays, was the first piece of text to mention the square pallet chain pump. It became commonly used in irrigation and infrastructure thereafter. Many philosophers of the time would consciously choose to live simple lifestyles in order to avoid self-indulgent temptations or corruption. This way of living took little to no effort for Wang Chong, for he had no fame, riches or titles to begin with. He was born into a poor family in Kwaji Commandery as a son to Wang Song. He was admired within his local community for his love and devotion towards his father. He was said to have studied by standing at bookstalls and had a superb memory, which allowed him to become very well versed in the Chinese classics. He eventually reached the rank of a district secretary, but soon lost the post due to his combative and anti-authoritarian nature. Under the direction of his parents, he travelled to Luoyang to study at the Imperial University. It was here that he became acquainted with the prestigious historian Ban Biao, who commenced the work on the Book of Han, then also his son, who continued his father's work. It was at this time that Wang Chong lacked enough money to purchase proper texts, so had frequent bookshops to acquire knowledge. Rafter Krepney states he was most likely heavily influenced by writers of his time, such as Huan Tan, who believed that harsher legalist punishments were needed. Huan Tan's first writing drew up a text which describes the trip hammer, a hydraulically powered device which was used to crush up grain. Because of Wang Chong's humble beginnings, he became resentful of any officials at the capital who were admired simply because of their wealth and power, not for any scholarly abilities. He returned to his home commandery, where he became a local teacher and was soon elevated to an officer of merit. He ended up resigning from this position due to his critical and quarrelsome nature, then entered a period of isolated retirement where he wrote many essays. On common morality, on severe disapprovals, on government, and on organic whole foods, were some of his works, of which around 80 were later compiled together by Wang Chong. At the centre of his school of thought was the denial that the heavens have any purpose for us, whether it be benevolent or hostile. To say that heaven provides us food and clothing is to say it acts as our farmer or tailor, an obvious absurdity. Humans are insignificant specks in the universe and cannot hope to affect changes in it. It's ludicrous arrogance to think the universe would change itself for us. He emphasised on the need to judge the words of previous sages critically, because they were often contradictory or inconsistent. He criticised not only the scholars of his time for not accepting this, but also the widespread popular acceptance of the ancient writings. He did however believe that the truth could be discovered, and would even become obvious after analysing it thoroughly, and commenting on the text until the words become clear. He argued that thunder must be caused by fire or heat, and is not a sign of the heavens being displeased. He thought that repeatable experiments should be carried out before adopting the belief that divine will was involved. He was equally critical about the popular belief in ghosts. Why should only human beings have ghosts, he asked, not other animals? We are all living creatures animated by the same vital principle. 
Besides, so many people have died that their ghosts would vastly outnumber living people, the world would be swamped by them. He never actually denies their existence, but instead separates them from the notion that they are the souls of the dead. He seems to believe the phenomena exist, but whatever they may be, they have no relation to the deceased. He wrote in the Lu Cheng, People say that spirits are the souls of dead men. That being the case, spirits should always appear naked, for surely it's not contended that clothes have souls as well as men. He knew that experience of the world, paired with careful reasoning, are needed to acquire knowledge of how things work. He stated that beliefs require evidence, just as actions require results. Anyone can prattle nonsense, and they'll always be able to find people to believe it, especially if they can dress up in superstitious flummery. His acute rationale and objective approach towards the universe earned him praise as being modern-minded, which is evident in his writings about the clouds and rain. The Confucians maintain the belief that the rain comes from the heavens, where the stars are. However, my consideration of the subject shows us that the rain comes from above earth, but not down from heaven. We see that rain gathers from above, so admittedly it comes from above the earth. How can we demonstrate that the rain originates in the earth and rises from the mountains? He cited a commentary on the spring and autumn annals which says, It evaporates upwards, through one or two inches thick, and then gathers. In a day's time, it can spread over the whole of the empire, but only if it comes from the Tai Shan. Wang believed this text meant that from Mount Tai, rain clouds can spread all over the empire, but from smaller mountains it will only reach a single province. The distance depends on the height. He stated, As to this coming of rain from the mountains, some people hold the thought that the clouds carry the rain with them, dispersing it as it goes, and they are right. Clouds and rain really are the same thing. Water goes upwards, then becomes clouds, which turns into rain or further into dew. When the garments of those travelling on high passes are moistened, it's not the effect of the clouds and mists they walk through, but the suspended rainwater within. When the moon follows the stars, there will be wind and rain, the approach of the moon will bring heavier rain showers. These two passages of the classics lead to the common belief that heaven itself causes the rain. What are we to say to this? When the rain comes from the mountains, the moon passes the stars into the Hades star cluster. As it approaches, there must be rain. If it does not rain, then the moon has not approached, and the mountains will have no clouds. Heaven and earth, above and below, always act in mutual resonance. When the moon approaches above, the mountains steam below as the embodiment of qi meets and unites. This is all part of the spontaneous nature of the Tao. Clouds and fog show that rain is coming. In summer, it turns to dew. In winter, to frost. If it's warm, it will rain. If it's cold, it will snow. Rain, dew and frost all come from the earth and do not descend from the heavens. This statement has been praised by modern biochemists for uniting the classic Chinese thought with radically modern ways of scientific thinking for his day. Although Wang Chong was right about the water cycle and other aspects of early science, his stern opposition to mainstream Confucian thought at the time made him a sceptic of all their theories. This included their teachings regarding eclipses, which the Confucian accepted model had already gotten correct. They had theorised that the light of the moon was simply a reflection of the light from the sun, that the planets are like yin, they have shape but no light. This understanding explained the effects of the lunar and solar eclipses, but Wang Chong went against the grain of the accepted theory. He simply did not accept that the weaker power of the moon could subdue the stronger power of the sun. He also didn't accept that these celestial bodies were completely round, but he simply had no knowledge of how gravity naturally forms large spherical bodies in space. Despite his self-imposed retirement, he was invited back into office by the inspector of Yang province to work as a headquarters officer. He quickly resigned from this post as well, but his friend and long-standing official then recommended him to serve under the Emperor, who accepted and sent out a summon. Wang Chong claimed to be ill, then refused the invitation to appear in court, then died later in his home at around the year 100. Although Wang Chong's rationalistic criticism of the so-called New Text Confucianism was largely ignored during his lifetime, Raf de Krepny states it became much more influential in Chinese thought in later years. The prominent scholar Ta Yong wrote about his admiration towards Wang's work. Whilst Wang Ling acquired a copy of the Lun Heng in 198 and brought it with him on his trip to the New Han court established by Tao Tao at Xu Chang. As a result of Wang Ling's presentation, some of the questionable tenets of the new text Confucianism were debated out of popularity and then fell out of use altogether. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and I'll see you next time.